2006, I was a college student at ASU. I lived in an off-campus apartment on the ground floor and it was a block off a major street here in Phoenix called Baseline. These details are important. In the summer of 2006, Phoenix, Arizona was plagued by two serial killers. One was a Phoenix shooter who ended up being a team of two guys randomly shooting people and the other was the Baseline killer, a rapist and murderer. Having two serial killers put the entire city on edge and everyone was talking about it. I even saw articles in Time or Newsweek about the situation. So, in the fall 2006 semester had just started. Now you may have heard of this, but Phoenix is hot in August. It would get stuffy in my apartment and so I'd leave the window cracked a little because the morning air is nice. The blinds provide a visual cover. Anyways, one morning, a strange sound woke me up. It was the crack of dawn, 4.45 a.m., and the sun was just barely coming up. The sound was a tapping sound, and it seemed intentional, but I thought it could be a bird, or some branches, or something trivial. I ignored it, and it went away for a bit. After about 90 seconds of silence, the tapping returned, and it was absolutely purposeful. In my mind, I thought it was my boyfriend, who thought it was cute to try and scare me sometimes. I decided I'd be a bit of a brat and make him wait. But I was also getting really angry. How dare he pull a prank when I'm trying to sleep? This is just like him. I'm gonna give him a piece of my mind about disturbing my sleep like this. The tapping continued. At a certain point, I got up to get a glass of water, still being in the mindset of wanting to annoy my stupid boyfriend who thought this would be funny. I saw some movement through the slit in the blinds, and I marched over and yanked the blinds so I could see. Definitely not my boyfriend. I said very loudly, What the fuck? He sort of seemed taken aback by my anger, but only slightly. The man I saw will be with me forever, or more specifically, his eyes and the feeling they gave me were insanely creepy. Honestly, words can't do justice to how terrifying his eyes were. They looked like black orbs with no white in them. Absolutely predatory. When I see pictures of Ted Bundy or Charles Manson, that's exactly what he looked like. Even if you saw a picture of how they looked, it's different when you experience it in person. He was crouched down like an umpire. He had on dark pants, a dark purple shirt, and a dark Nike hat. He had dark skin. I thought he was Hispanic, but later, I found out he was a light-skinned black guy. You'll find out how I learned his name later. Anyways, after I yelled what the fuck at him, he whispers to me, can I talk to you? If you want to know how insanely creepy that is to hear, just whisper that sentence out loud to yourself right now. It still sends chills down my spine when I think of how that sounded. His hand subtly moved towards his waist. I later learned he would blitz attack his victims and he probably had a gun. Now, this is about a three second interaction at this point. For some reason, I thought of Ted Bundy and how he'd pretended to be crippled to target his victims. I thought of my mom telling me not to be nice to strangers. Don't be afraid to be a bitch. My thinking wasn't as calculated as that, but it was more the nano processing of how I was dealing with the situation. So when he whispered that, I started yelling at him. Hell no! Fuck out of here, douchebag. I shut the window angrily and locked it. I laid back down and wondered if I'd been too mean. What if he needed help? But then why would he be like tapping and whispering? If he was in trouble, he's probably a creep after all. I was too annoyed to go back to sleep, but I sort of laid back down. I told my roommate about it an hour later, and she sort of jokingly asked if he could have been the baseline killer. When she said that, my heart sank. His face looked exactly like it did in the police sketches that were on billboards everywhere. The only problem is that those billboards showed him with dreads, and the man at my window had no dreads. Apparently, he was some sort of disguise artist who'd wear wigs. Updating the police sketch would have been a nice move, but they didn't. I called the Phoenix police, and the detective I talked to agreed that it sounded like his M.O. The suspect would say something to throw off his target, and then he'd blitz attack. The detective said that my angry response probably made me seem too much of a hassle and moved on. The only problem was that I thought the guy looked Hispanic and the detective said many witnesses described him as black. 
I thought they might want to come out and try for samples or surveillance video or something, but I didn't hear back from the detective. My parents freaked out, then got us knives, pepper spray, and put up signs. We tried to leave the apartment complex, and we learned another tenant had complained about the exact same thing. I never learned the details, but this idiot was apparently going around the damn complex, trying to find a target. The stupid apartment won't let us out of our lease. So we moved to a second floor apartment, right above our old unit. Side note, the neighbors who moved into our old unit were horrible. Obnoxious tweakers who would do meth and play pitbull on repeat for hours and have knife fights at 11am on weekdays. There were times I wondered if they might be worse than the actual serial killer who came to my window. So that unit was cursed somehow. Anyways, on September 4th, 2006. They arrested Mark Gudo. I think the detective didn't call me back because they were days away from arresting Gudo. When I saw his mugshot, I was sick, but also relieved. He was absolutely the guy outside my window. To me, he looked like he could be Hispanic. You can judge for yourself if you Google it. He's on death row in Arizona now. His wife tried to mount some campaign to show that police were framing him or something. On a personal level, it certainly would make for an interesting coincidence if the framed innocent guy was also whispering like a creep and tapping my window. The other cool thing about this story is that I had a really bad eating disorder at the time, and about 8 months after this happened, I got in solid recovery. I never would have experienced how wonderful life could be if the slightest thing would have changed that morning in 2006. I can't think of something more scary than a serial killer tapping on your window. That actually happened to me. And if it happens to you, just scare them right back. Don't be afraid to be downright rude to someone who's injecting themselves into your space. It could save your life if you're not afraid to throw your weight around and tell someone off. This happened about two weeks after I bought my first home in December of 2010. I was 22 and this was the first time I had ever lived alone. About 9-10 to 10 days after moving in, I adopted a dog my sister and mom saw at a local shelter. An abused, breeding male cocker, matted hair down his spine and everywhere else, 12 pounds underweight and wormy. I named him Jack Donahue and he's still sleeping next to me today as I type this. The house I bought wasn't in the best neighborhood, but it backed up to an elementary school's playground and cameras faced my backyard. It was a day or two before Christmas, so my office was closed and I was home. The way my home was set up, to the right of the fridge was a window looking out to my front porch with my front door at a 90 from the window. This is where my kitchen table was. If you were in the middle of the kitchen and look left, there was a second living room and side door with a half a window. It was the only window I had installed blinds on. You could not see the kitchen table from the side door. So I'm sitting at the table looking through mail or something, and a shadow passes over my papers in front of me. The blinds were closed, but if you were on my front porch, you were so close to the window, your body created a shadow. I do not know why, but I felt uneasy. No one should have been there. So I dropped off my stool to the ground and kind of peeked at the crack in the blinds. There were two men I didn't know on my porch. One was really big, wearing a white shirt and jeans, but I never saw his face because he was facing my front door. The other was wearing a red baseball cap and a really, really baggy red shirt. Honestly, at first I thought they may have a legit reason to be there. I'd already had one guy looking for his dog, but I hear the big one say, fucking go around, man. The red shirt guy walks away and I lose sight of him. I lean to my left and saw a red shirt come up to my side door. All right, this is scary for me now. Then suddenly, they both start slamming their hands into both my front door and my side door, just pounding so hard that my tiny little house was shaking. That's when the sweet, little underweight cocker spaniel that I hadn't even had for a week loses his ever-loving mind, starts baring its teeth, runs directly at the side door because he can see the guy. Just the loudest barking I've ever heard from him to date. Red shirt yells, Holy shit! She got a fucking dog! and tears off running, big man following behind. I was so grateful to Jack. If he hadn't been there, 
Those guys would have made it in. It was an old little house, built in 55, and still had single pane windows. I filed a report with the police, but never heard anything back regarding the men. Which was okay, because to my knowledge, they never came back. I've moved away five years later. Jack saved me from something bad that day. He's been treated like a prince ever since. Honestly, he's the gentlest dog anyone's ever met. Even Buck's a traditional Cocker Spaniel's not liking children idea. But I think he knew I was his person from day one, and nobody was going to mess with his human. So, white and red shirt dude, let's not meet. Because Jack is still here, and will tear your asses up. This happened about six months ago, and I recently took an Uber for the first time since this incident, so I thought I'd share. I was leaving a work function at a bar around midnight in a large city about an hour away from the suburban home I share with my partner. For reference, I'm a woman in my mid-twenties with an average build, not tall, not strong, definitely not threatening in any way, and I was a bit buzzed that night. I'm talking like three drinks so not incapacitated in the slightest. Anyway, I'd ordinarily take a company car home, but I hadn't reserved one since I didn't know what time I'd be leaving, so I just decided to Uber. The company reimburses me for the bill anyway, so it was no difference to me. Once the Uber pulls up, I say goodbye to my colleagues and get in the back seat. I'm always very nice to my Uber drivers, so I introduce myself. This driver, let's call him Ed, since I don't actually know his real name, seemed totally normal, no red flags, and we make pleasant conversation for about 15 minutes, until we are squarely out of the city, on the way to the suburbs. From this pleasant conversation, I learn he lives in a certain neighborhood, not far from my home. Note that his neighborhood, while relatively nearby, would be completely out of the way on the route we are taking to my home. The conversation reaches its natural end, so I just stay a bit quiet and start looking at my phone. The quiet is interrupted by his voice, suggesting I take a nap if I feel tired. It didn't even strike me as weird at first, so I just thanked him for the offer, but I wasn't that tired. He then said, Oh, I always get sleepy when I'm drunk. Are you sure? At this point, something in my body made me even more wide awake than before. I replied that I wasn't drunk, and like I had said, I just had a few drinks, so no need to nap. I'll be home soon enough anyway. He drops it after that, but I still thought it was weird he'd say that. About five minutes later, he says that the highway has some weird construction going on, and that the single lane traffic ahead would make my trip way longer than it needs to be. He asked if it was okay to take another route. I oblige, already on edge and just wanting to be at home. My partner calls at that moment, asking when I'll be home, and I make sure to make it very clear I was talking to my significant other. Something was weird about this guy, and I wanted him to know that someone is expecting me at a specific time and knows where I am. After I hang up the phone, the Uber driver stays quiet and we get off the highway on a different exit than I have ever used, but I guess that's to be expected on a different route home. I'm bullshitting on my phone because I don't want to talk to this guy anymore, not even looking up until he says, My house is only 5 minutes from here. Okay. Pit in my stomach. I'm probably a good 25 minutes away from my house right now. A distance enlarged, I'd later learn artificially. By his shortcut. I say some nonsense about how I like the neighborhood, and how my boyfriend and I were thinking of moving here instead. Blah blah. Basically anything I can think of, to make it seem like I don't think this is weird. And I'm not picking up any signals. Surprisingly, he doesn't say anything in response, and now starts driving on a road in a direction. I knew led to my house. Phew. Crisis averted, right? Except not really. Fifteen minutes to go. My surroundings are more familiar. Just as I'm starting to feel more at ease, he starts asking questions about my boyfriend. What does he do? How long have you guys been together? And other seemingly normal questions. Finally, with about ten minutes to go, he asks if my boyfriend makes me happy. He does very much, so I gush a bit and say, Yes, he makes me very happy. And then he asks if I make him happy. I thought that was weird, but humor is my defense mechanism, so I say, 
Well, I should hope so. Eight minutes away, he turns onto a side street and pulls over on the side of the road, looks back at me over his headrest, and asks if I'd make him happy too. I said, what? Mostly because I can't even believe what's happening. He asks again, do you want to make me happy tonight? I took a second to think through my options. I'm alone with this guy who's behind the wheel. This street is dark, and I don't see any lights on at nearby houses. Close to 1am at this point, on a weeknight, and I don't know what the hell this guy has in the car. I default to the response many women know to be the true barrier to men's advances. I don't think my boyfriend would like that very much. His weird grin falls away from his face, and he says, He doesn't have to find out. Come on, make me happy. I know a few ways you can start. I tell him my boyfriend is expecting me home any minute. And besides, I love him. I don't want to hurt him. Can you please just take me home? I carry a small knife and a little canister of mace. But all I could think of was to appeal to this guy's sensitive side. Somehow, it worked. And he didn't say another word after that. Just turned back around and silently drove me home. Weirdly enough, I say thanks as I get out of the car. Old habits die hard, I guess. And that was that. I go into my house and start crying immediately for some reason. As soon as I hug my partner, he tells me I need to contact Uber immediately and tell them what happened so that this guy doesn't try to take advantage of anyone else. I agree and pull up the app to file the complaint. Except when I looked at my last ride, the picture in the profile was 100% not the guy who drove me home. The car was the same, but not the driver. The guy in the photo was brown and wore a turban, maybe early 40s. The guy who drove me home was white and seemed just a bit older than me. Uber never followed up with me and just refunded my money. I did tell the police what happened because my partner insisted, but they didn't take me seriously since nothing actually happened. I was worried for a while since this guy knew where I lived. But apparently, it's long forgotten since I just took an Uber today. Moral of the story, always make sure the photo and your Uber driver's profile matches the person who's driving the car. Creepy driver that didn't actually work for Uber. Let's not meet. I was driving home when I realized the truck had been behind me for miles. Just to be precautious, I made an abrupt last second U-turn. He did too. It was there that I realized he was following me. While on the phone with 911, I made sharp turns and ran red lights to try to lose him. He wouldn't stop, literally almost hitting my car a couple of times as he sped up, trying to catch up. The 911 operator instructed me to go to a local grocery store and wait for the police. I parked right in front of the store's entrance, surveillance cameras, and waited. He decided to park his car at a distance and waited for me to get out of my car. All of a sudden, I heard a hard knock at window. I freaked out and it turned out to be the grocery manager, letting me know 911 just notified him of the situation. He asked if I wanted to go inside the store and he would protect me until the cops arrived. I honestly feared the worst and told him no. I was shaking but I thought this maniac might have a gun. He could shoot me and everyone in there. Cops arrived and luckily cornered him in the back of the parking structure. I was shaking as they came to my car, my hand gripping the wheel very tightly. They arrested him soon after for a third DUI and police filed a report. I didn't know who he was. Apparently, he lived a couple of miles away from me. Unfortunately, two months later, I received a letter to notify me that I may be subpoenaed. I call the DMV who issued the letter and they notify me that not only is he free again, but that my information including my address were on the police report that was provided to him and his attorney. Thanks LAPD. I now live in fear. He may come any day and hurt me. When I was about 8 years old, my mother and I lived in a small town in a building with small apartments and rooms that people could rent, live in, or leave whenever. My mother was super poor, so it was all we could afford. A tiny apartment with neighbors changing every week. My then best friend Cassandra 
who was also eight years old, used to come spend the night every Saturday. We would usually go play in the long corridors of the building, in the same floor as our apartment, and if it wasn't cold and rainy, we'd go out into the parking lot to play. That's what we did that day, but my mother didn't like it when we weren't close to her, so after ten minutes of playing, I told Cassandra we should get back in before we got in trouble. Just as I was opening the entrance door to the building with my keys, some tall, thin man in his thirties, I couldn't remember much of him, but he definitely didn't give the creepy pedophile vibe, literally appeared out of nowhere from behind us to hold the door for us. We thanked him, obviously thinking nothing of it. I never saw him before, but like I said, anyone could rent and leave even if it was for one day. So it wasn't weird to see someone I wasn't used to seeing around. He kept smiling and started talking to us and following us to the elevator. He was genuinely smiling, like he was so happy to see us and talk to us. As we waited for the elevator to come, he kept asking questions like, What floor do you live on? What's your name and age? How long have you known each other for? Just random questions to which we responded truthfully. We went in the elevator. He pressed on floor 2 and I pressed floor 4. When the door of the elevator closed, he started getting creepier. He told us how pretty we were, how he liked our hair, how it was perfect that I was dark haired and my friend blonde. He told me that I seemed to have a really nice body, how nice that I was tall and slender. This didn't come across as weird or creepy to my 8 years old brain because a very friendly old female neighbor that used to live next to us always told me how I should model for kids clothes and she used to say how she wished she had my body when she was younger. So him giving me compliments about my body wasn't a red flag. I smiled and thanked him. Floor 2 was his floor. The elevator opens and he prevents the door from closing again. No one was around. Now I was starting to think that he was being weird. He told us that he worked for TV and he was a photographer for magazines. He said he was quite reputed and that he dealt with models, celebrities, etc. He said that he thinks we have potential and that's why he complimented us. He said he'd take pictures of us in a bikini and cute little dresses. My friend was excited about it. I was too, but for some reason, I was very skeptical. He told us to follow him to his room, and we'd see how he wasn't bullshitting us. That he'd show us his professional camera, and he said he was used to taking pictures of kids, and that he made some of them very popular. He said he had candies and toys we could keep. I said that I should talk to my mother first. He said, No, don't tell your parents. Parents want you to stay in school. Only tell them after I take pictures and videos of you two. And when your parents see them and you become popular, they will be okay with it. That's exactly what he said. I remember every single word. And I am 23 years old now. The whole, I made kids popular before. Your parents will see the pictures and videos. You'll be on the TV and magazines thing. Sounds very creepy and sinister now that I know what he actually was. Before I could say anything else, my friend walked out of the elevator and told me to come. He was grinning at me and he said, Come on, it would be a shame if your friend got famous and not you. And we ended up following him to his room because of my friend. I didn't think it was right to just leave her. His room was down the long ass corridor. How convenient that it was so far from the elevator and stairs. He opened his room and there was a camera on a tripod in the middle of the room in front of the bed. There were toys mostly girl toys and stuffed animals on the desk next to the bed. At that moment, I thought he was actually telling the truth, but as I was looking around and as I glanced at him, grinning like he just won the jackpot and gesturing us to get in, I had a really bad feeling. My guts told me to leave right then. I didn't know what a pedophile was then. I didn't even think about him possibly wanting to hurt us or touch us. I just knew that something was off and I listened to my guts. And so without saying anything, I grabbed my friend's hand and started to back away, saying that my mother is probably worried and we should be home now. He didn't say anything. We walked back and you know when you're walking in a dark corridor or somewhere else at night and you feel like something is going to grab you from behind and you get goosebumps? That's exactly how I felt. And so as soon as I heard his steps following behind us, I started running without even warning my friend. Obviously, she started running too, and I slammed the door to the stairs open, and in the corner of my eyes, I could see him coming after us. I literally jumped on the stairs until floor 4 with my friend asking me why I was running and saying that I was freaking her out. He stopped running after us as soon as we reached the stairs, 
We banged on my apartment's door and slammed it shut behind us right when my mother opened it. We told her everything, what floor he was on, the number of the room, and everything he told us. She called the police, and when they came to have a chat with him, they found the door open with nothing and no one inside. From that day on, I wasn't allowed to play outside or in the corridor anymore, and my mother got super paranoid and overprotective with me. We moved apartments, and then a year later, we moved somewhere else. I never seen or heard of that man again. Seriously, people. Always trust your guts. If you feel like you should run and get away from someone, don't think about it twice. God knows what would have happened if we went inside his room. First one, going back to August 6, 2005, 48th Street and Baseline. Two girls are sexually assaulted behind this church. In September, a 19-year-old woman is killed and two sisters raped. Then, on September 28th, a mother and her young daughter are abducted in their car outside a Mexican restaurant on Central Avenue near Baseline. Both are sexually assaulted. The violence continues to escalate from December to March. Five more people are killed. And one of the drivers walked up to me and he said, did you hear what happened to your wife? And that's when I kind of like lost it. Amelia Vargas and her cook were brutally murdered inside their food truck by killer Mark Udo. The couple had four-month-old twins at the time.